Have you ever finished an online data analytics or data science certificate and yet still don't feel ready for the job? Or you feel like what you've learned is still too shallow and insufficient? More often than not, it's not about you that you haven't got enough experience. I think it comes down to a few very fundamental and important things that data science courses often don't teach you. What's up everyone? My name is Tuvu. I'm a data science consultant and this channel is all about helping you get started and become better in data science. The first thing and one of the most striking things I've noticed so far is that many online programs don't teach you about good coding practices. You often don't learn about using a style guide to make your code easier to read and understand. Hey, can you send me the Jupyter notebook you just made with analysis? I'll have a quick look. Yeah, sure, I'm sending it right now. Oh, great, thank you. Why are you putting all the code in one line with no comments and space? Oh, yeah, I just thought it made the code shorter and nicer. Is it a big deal? Apparently, coding styles are often not taught even in a data analytics degree at university. Good coding practices also include following certain coding principles, for example, not repeating yourself or not writing redundant code. Instead, it's better to create a specialized function and reuse it in your code. And functions should be modular, independent from each other, and should solve a specific problem. For instance, the code that loads a dataset shouldn't do anything else like data cleaning or data transformation and shouldn't depend on any other module to be able to work. Another real example when I was looking at the IBM Data Science Professional Certificate, which is by the way a great course in many aspects, but I want to show you an example to show you why sometimes you might accidentally learn bad coding practices from one of those courses. Let's take a look at this coding assignment and see what's the problem here. As you can see, Firstly, we initiate some global variables here as empty lists, which is fine. But somehow this get booster version function could sort of secretly change the value of the booster version variable here. So this variable was previously empty, but now it is updated through calling this get booster version function. Modifying a global variable like this is considered a poor coding practice. It is because it can cause really unexpected effects in your code. Imagine later if you want to use the booster version variable again you thought it was an empty list, but it is not anymore because it's already secretly modified in another process that you might not be aware of. A better way to do this is to send the booster version variable as a parameter and then have the value be returned in the return statement. Don't get me wrong, these courses are really great to get your feet off the ground when you just started learning data science, but we also should be aware of what they are lacking. The second thing data analytics and data science courses don't teach you is the basics of design. In the past few years, I've come to realize that building dashboards and visualizations is not just about putting together a bunch of colorful charts and tables to show the KPIs and trends. A good dashboard often requires a lot more designing skill than you might think. A good visualization and good storytelling do not only summarize the data, but also shows it in a way that is easy to understand and pleasant to look at. Well, we absolutely don't need to become an UI designer or graphics designer, but it doesn't hurt to know some simple basic rules that teach you how to color your charts, how to design the composition of your dashboard, what text size should you use for certain information on the dashboard, etc. They might seem a bit trivial, but these details might contribute a lot to how effective and successful your visualization is. I remember a saying I read somewhere, there is no such thing as information overload, there's only bad design. I think it's kind of true. The third thing data analytics courses often like or touch very lightly on is analysis techniques and statistical methods. This seems to hold true for a lot of certificates out there, namely Google Data Analytics Professional Certificate, which doesn't cover any statistics. IBM Data Analyst Professional Certificate and IBM Data Science Certificate touch a little bit on correlation and linear regression, but that is pretty much it. The videos on linear regression even gloss over some very important points, which I'll talk about later in this video. It is understandable that those courses aim to give you a more hands-on experience working with Excel, Python, and R, and I'm must admit that not all data analysts or even data scientists would have to use a lot of statistics in their jobs, especially if you are working more with SQL or data retrieval. So you're very welcome to disagree with me here. I'm just speaking more from my personal experience right now that the more statistical techniques and methods you know to use, the bigger and more powerful your toolkit would be. So one of my first assignments as a data analyst goes like this. Hey, can you help me identify those customers who are outliers in our data set? I need the analysis for my report. Oh, by the way, if you can send it to me by the end of the day, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. 
please tell me there's something here. No. Back then, the most advanced thing I knew was correlation and linear regression. I sort of knew how to identify outliers, for example, using box plots or scatter plots, but doing outlier detection for more than two features, I had no idea what to do. Hey Tom, I need your help. I'm on my second day at work and my boss is asking me to do some sort of outlier detection on the data. Do you know how to do that? Well, do you know clustering analysis? Oh yeah. Another method you can also use is isolation forest, but it can be a bit more complicated because you have to scale the data uh, first. Wait, wait, what is scaling? Look, sorry I have to catch the train. Talk to you later. Another common analysis problem is to measure similarities. For example, if we have three ice cream stores that sell different number of ice creams of different kinds, given this information, how do we know which stores are more similar to each other in terms of sales? Another example is using Bayes' theorem for data inference and decision making, which is very useful if you're working on scenario analysis, predict the probability of some event to happen. Or if you're working with survey data, it's important to know how to perform conjoint analysis for market research to understand the underlying customer preferences. They're all very useful statistical methods for a wide range of analysis problems, but they are completely overlooked in the data science courses we see today. We might not do machine learning on a day-to-day -day basis as a data analyst or data scientist, but these techniques are what we do use to solve daily problems. It's locked! Don't worry, I'll give you some suggestions on how to learn more about these methods and techniques later in this video. It's getting a bit weird in my room. The next thing that's often missing in data science courses is how to use Git version control and how to collaborate with others. I remember in my first data analyst job, I used to attach my R code to an email to send to my coworker. So whenever I change something in the code, I then send an email to my coworker saying, this is the updated code, please look at this version. I had never heard of Git before, I had no idea what it is for and why I should use it. If you haven't started using Git for your programming project, look has a very good video on this where he explained what Git is and how to use it. I find this so important because data analysts and data scientists almost never work alone. We most often need to collaborate with other analysts or people from different departments or even different companies. Another funny thing I remember is how inefficient I was when coding in R back then. And again, code performance and how to write clean and efficient code is not taught in online courses. I used to use for loops for everything and I remember I remember talking to one of my friends very proudly. I did some programming at my work and my code took three hours to run. And he was like, wow, it must be very complicated. You are so smart. I'm so proud of you. Little did I know that there was a way to do exactly what I was trying to do in a way that would probably take three minutes to run. Even though this skill would come eventually with experience, but I wish I was aware of this sooner. And thus not losing so much time waiting for my code to run or complaining why our Python is so slow. Little things like vectorizing your code, using lambda functions and avoiding for loops. These little things you learn by actively measuring your code performance and trying to find out why a piece of code is so slow or where it got stuck. There are a lot of resources for this on Stack Overflow if you actively look for it. With all the things mentioned, I'm not trying to discourage you from taking these data science courses because they are really a great first step. What's more important is that now you're more aware of the blind spots in those courses and then keep chipping away at the missing pieces until you feel confident with your data analysis skills. And some of the skills I mentioned earlier, you will eventually learn on the job and build up over time so you don't have to learn everything at once. And here are some ways that I have used to fill the gaps myself. Firstly, for coding practices, the best starting point is to browse through the style guides of the programming language you are using. For Python, PEP8 is a document that provides guidelines and best practices on how to write Python code. I'd recommend you to check it out early on when you just started learning Python to avoid developing bad coding habits. For R, you can look into Google Style Guides, which is a very similar document but for coding in R. Secondly, I think YouTube is the best friend when it comes to learning. For example, I love watching 3 Blue 1 Brown channel to learn about some hard math and statistical concepts in a more visual way. Here's a video he explains about Bayes' theorem and there are tons of other videos as well on his channel. The other very good option is books. 
But avoid those that are too theoretical because they will send you to sleep very soon. Use those that have coding examples in R or Python to make it easier to follow. I'll link some of them in the description box below. I've come to appreciate books more now as I realize that they provide you with valuable nuances that are often not discussed in online courses. For example, the videos on linear regression in the IBM course don't discuss the assumptions of linear regression. In fact, in order for a regression model to be consistent and reliable, several conditions or several assumptions must be met. For example, the explanatory variables must be independent from each other. There are certainly different techniques to overcome these issues, but using linear regression blindly is surprisingly dangerous in practice. For one of my projects, I encountered someone who created a regression model to find out whether there exists a gender bias in the employee salary dataset. So the idea is that we create a regression model that predicts the salary based on gender, job function, and years of experience, etc. Using the coefficient of the gender variable, we might be able to determine if the gender has a positive or negative effect on salary. That sounds good, right? Theoretically, yes, but in this case, it is very problematic. It is because function and gender are actually highly correlated with each other. High function employees are often males and not females for many different reasons. Therefore, they receive higher salary. And this correlation causes the estimated coefficients to be no longer valid or reliable. And that is why my colleague actually found out that the gender has a negative coefficient, suggesting that all things stay equal females tend to earn more than males, which is simply not true. We knew for a fact that there was a gender bias in favor of males in this data set. For data visualization design, I don't actually take extra courses or anything. I have a couple of data visualization books here and there, like this one, Visualize This by Nathan Yeo. Uh, he's a blogger and I loved his blog, so I bought his book. But generally, what I did was often just to look at some well-designed dashboards on Tableau Public for inspiration or browse through a lot of data visualization blogs and the New York Times newspapers. And then I just pay attention to how they design their visualization, what color palette they use, and how they arrange different elements in the charts. I'll put some of the links for you down below. A lot of times I just try to steal some of the smart ideas they have and incorporate them in my work. And together with a lot of practice, you'll get better in no time at designing your own dashboards and visualization. Actually, after making this video, I'm now fancy writing an ebook that's sort of like a hitchhiker guide to data analysis and visualization that gives you a more practical set of tools and techniques for your day-to-day -day job. So let me know what you think about this idea in the comment below. Thank you, you saved my life! And again, if you got any value from this video, don't forget to like this video or subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye!